their feet and give presentations, and it's not viewed as that odd. <laughs> um, so I'll take advantage of that. <clears throat> what I'll be talking about um, tonight is the results of 15 years of coral reef monitoring here on Maui. Uh, you know, monitoring, <laughs> I'm not really going to go into a whole lot of detail, but monitoring is not question driven. It's really just measuring change over time. So we go out, we set up sites, we measure what's happening on the reef over time. And then depending on what we find, we oftentimes are, are going back and trying to figure out, okay, what's going on, what's driving this. Uh, so that's an important thing because it distinguishes monitoring from actual uh, scientific experimentation or something, which may be driven by a, que a direct question. The other thing that's important just to bear in mind is I'll talk in general terms about areas, Lalaia Bay, you know, Kaikili or North Kanapali. Um, and I'll be showing data that's from a very specific um, study site within that reef. So just because what we see at our study site shows declines doesn't mean the entire reef in that area is experiencing it. It usually does. And it's a warning sign for us to go and look further and more detail in the, in the reef in the area. But it's not always indicative of what's happening in the whole general area. So it's just something to bear in mind. <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll go through and I'll talk about several examples of what's happening on the reef. Uh, in many of the cases, even though the monitoring is not question driven, we still have really obvious stressors that we can identify that are most likely driving the decline in those areas. So I'll explain some of that that's going on. Um, we'll then go into fish, fish stocks, what's, what's up with fish stocks and how we know. And I hope to leave it on a slightly positive note, which is somewhat difficult to do when you're talking about declines on coral reefs. But um, there's several management things that we've started recently and other things that are right on the horizon that I think do give us some cause for hope. Um, and really, management is um, it's a public process. We're public servants, and we do require public input. And so that, I think, really should be one of the main take-home messages from all of you, is that you know if you get involved, support, or even if you don't support what we're proposing, get involved in the process, you should have a much bigger impact on moving things forward. Uh, and it really, it depends on your involvement for us to get things moving forward. <clears throat> I've scanned the audience. There's a few familiar faces, but I'm really happy to see a lot of you I don't recognize. So that means probably you won't be too terribly bored with a lot of the replicate slides that I've shown many times before. And uh, those of you who are, I tried to add some update stuff really recently, like this afternoon up to about 3 o'clock. <laughs> so um, hopefully, hopefully it'll be different than any of the presentations I've given in the past. Again, for those of you who see my presentations, I apologize for this slide. I've been using it for about 10 years. But um, it's cut out of the Maui news, and I think it's a very good illustration of what's happening with our reefs. A kid walks into a aquarium store, and he asks the guy, what do you need to make a realistic marine environment? And the aquarium store owner's uh, answer is you need agricultural runoff, coastal overdevelopment, unprocessed sewage, and depleted fish species. Um, basically, the take home message is there's plenty of blame to go around. Coral reefs from Maui, as well as all over the world, are being stressed and killed and degraded by a thousand cuts. There's all of these different stressors, and they all add up to really cause what we're seeing on our reefs. So when we start thinking about management and how we can improve coral reefs, you know, it may be overwhelming when you think about all of the impacts, but if you can just start to remove one or two or three here and there, the reef should start to recover somewhat from where they're currently at. Um, the other main issue here is, you know, there's plenty of blame to go around and everybody likes to blame someone else. And that oftentimes prevents us from doing anything. We want to make fishing regulations. Fishermen will say, why are you always picking on us? It's the developers or the uh, polluters. And you start talk, you know, talking about changing uh, irrigation or fertilizer practices or different ways of treating and disposing of sewage. They're blaming it on someone else. So everybody can blame someone else. And that oftentimes blocks us from making any progress. So 
bear that in mind because I think that's a hurdle as a society we need to get past. We need to identify the things we can change and change them and, and just see the, the long term picture as we move forward. Okay, just some real obvious examples from Mali of some of the threats to our reefs. Land based pollution is kind of a huge one. And this is uh, anywhere where people are around, or even not on high islands, you're going to have erosion, sediment events. Generally, development or changes to land make that worse. Um, but heavy doses of, sand, of dirt washing in the ocean is a bad thing for corals. Invasive algae, we oftentimes pick that out as a problem specifically. And I think we've learned over the years that really it's more of a symptom or a, a sign of a problem. It's nutrients that the algae is feeding off of. And so it's that nutrient pollution that's coming off land that we can really try to address. Obviously, also, we have alien species of certain types of algae that we should try to prevent from getting here or control if they are as well. Overfishing is one of the major ones, equal in a lot of respects, if not worse, than land based pollution because it changes that structure in the ecosystem. If you fish down certain key species that play an important role on the reef, you've taken away some of that protective mechanisms on the reef. And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. General overuse and then what comes from that oftentimes is accidents, whether it be people stepping or kicking on the reef or, be, or boats sinking or carelessly deployed anchors or things of that sort. That all kind of goes together and that clearly has a direct impact on the reef as well. Can you guys on the other side of the room hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah. I can move around over here from time to time. Yeah, just so. nice. <laughs> I'll start pacing back and forth at some point, probably. Um, so I'd like to start out just with a, a real general, quick overview of Coral Reef Ecology 101. And you know, basically, this could be like a whole semester, a whole year course, but I'll zip it out real quick. And what I kind of want you guys to come away from, I, I'm sure a lot of you are water people and you like being out snorkeling or diving. And you know, you go out and you see a reef, and you know, depending on your experience, it may look perfectly fine to you. But there's, you know, if you start to look a little more critically, you'll see a lot of things wrong with our reefs. And a lot of our reefs are kind of in an intermediate level of, of degradation. There still may be a lot of coral, still may be a fair amount of fish, and things may look all right, but the, they may be fairly stressed and on their verge of decline. So in this picture, I just kind of have, you know, the, the opposite extremes. A healthy reef, lots of coral. You know, whether it's not coral, there's bare rock, or there's coral and algae or something, and then a, a reef that's been completely degraded and overgrown with algae. Hopefully, you can tell which one's healthy and which one's not. <clears throat> but like I said, many of our reefs fall somewhere in between here, and it's not nearly as clear. So the, the first thing that, to know about a coral reef is that there should be several key components on the reef. Right? There should be large, obvious apex predators, sharks and aluas, omilus, barracudas, things like that, swim around. And these should be fairly dominant. Okay? You should see large grazing herbivores, parrotfish, big um, palani, kalas, things of that sort. You should see big schools of grazing fish, like the manini. Most of the bottom should be covered with stony corals. And what's not covered with coral should be covered with Crustose coral and algae, which is just that purple and pink stuff that grows on the bottom. We've learned a lot over the last few years about that, and it actually, you know, even though it doesn't look like much, it's kind of the cement on the reef, and it glues everything together and secures it, and it's a, it changes the chemistry in the area so that coral polyps will settle out on that. They'll actually seek out coral and algae to settle out and establish. So it's an important landing had, so to speak, for new corals that want to come into the area as well. So you should see all those things. They should be obvious. Uh, there might be some macroalgae or some seaweed, but you're going to have to look hard for it on a healthy reef because the fish are going to keep it cropped back down into the little cracks and crevices. There's going to be bacteria and there's going to be viruses. That's all part of a natural ecosystem, but you're not going to see it, obviously, because it's microscopic. And it's going to be kind of in balance with everything. That's what you should have on a healthy reef. Now, this is kind of the textbook stuff, so I apologize for taking you back to high school here. But if you think about 
coral reef ecosystem, the main energy source is your sun. Okay? And your sun is generating energy that's being used by the crustal coral and algae to fill in and cement things together. It's being used by the corals because the corals have a, a, a symbiotic cell that lives within them called zooxanthellae, right? It's like a plant cell. And that photosynthesizes and generates sugars and so forth. So the corals are generating a lot of their energy from the sun directly. And then the seaweed is growing off of that energy from the sun. Okay. And then the fish, the reef fish eat the seaweed and the predatory fish eat the reef fish. So in a healthy ecosystem, the big circles is where most of your energy is being stored in terms of biomass. Lots of coral, coral and algae, lots of reef fish, and big predatory fish. That's a healthy system, and it should look something like this, right? Bottoms covered with living coral. You don't see any algae. There should be some fish swimming around, and then big predators hanging out as well. When that becomes degraded by people, anthropogenic effects, generally in the form of nutrients into the system from fertilizers, sewage, uh, farming, you name it, That'll come in and that fertilizers help with the sun's energy generate a lot of nutrients from the fertilizers mixing with the sun and the macroalgae and the seaweed grows very fast. Especially certain species of seaweed that are adapted to really grab all of that nutrients from the system and pulses and turn it into the biomass very quickly. These are the ones that tend to be invasive. Okay? So that seaweed grows real quickly. Oftentimes quicker than the fish in the area can feed on it, and then it starts to degrade and break down. And that that process, you know, there's a lot of nutrients in seaweed, it's breaking down, a lot of uh, microbes will be fueling off of that, so a lot more bacteria will come into the system. That process of decomposition, as we all know, if we're farming and do uh, compost and stuff, generates or liberates those nutrients back into the system. So. Nutrients from people causes the seaweed to grow. The seaweed gets broken down by bacteria, releasing more nutrients, and we get this positive cycle where it just continues to build and build and build, causing a huge bloom of algae. And all of the energy being stored in the system now is in the algae and in the microbes. The fish don't have any place to hang out. There's no fish for the predators to feed on. Corals being smothered by the algae. Crustals, coral, and algae doesn't have anywhere to grow either. So those things in a healthy system that are dominant are now almost insignificant. And instead, what you end up is an ecosystem that looks like this. Okay. Not much of anything of coral, smothered with algae. Water quality becomes highly degraded. Um, it's not a good situation for anybody. Plants are, are for animals that live there or for people necessarily. And this process can happen pretty quickly because primarily because of this positive cycle where it just kind of um, exponentially accelerates the amount of nutrients and algae growing in the air. Best way I could think of to, to illustrate this is the Jenga game. Anybody, you guys all played this before? Right? So you pull out the little blocks, you stack them on top, and if you're if you're into trying to make your the people you're playing with lose, you might try and set them off to the side and make it kind of unstable. And as it gets higher and as you pull out more blocks, it still looks like a tower, but it's becoming less and less stable. And that's how a lot of our reefs are. They still look like a reef, but they're becoming less and less stable. They don't have as much resilience to stress anymore. And then some, some uh, knucklehead comes out and removes all of the herbivores from the area, perhaps, you know, one of the key blocks. Or maybe the disease sets in and all the sea urchins die, another key block. Whatever it is, something changes, that block's pulled, and overnight, basically, the reef degrades and becomes overgrown with algae. It happens very really quickly, and I'll show you from our data, it's not overnight necessarily, but it can be in a, a series of just a few years that a reef can go from a functional high coral cover reef to basically something like this. Okay, so this is real quick in a nutshell, you know, 15 plus years of coral cover, monitor, uh, monitoring coral cover. And, you know, when you're monitoring a coral reef, there's a lot of different parameters you can look at. Coral cover is by far the simplest, but it doesn't tell us everything about a reef. 
So just bear that in mind. I mean, basically what we're doing is we're taking photos of the same section of the reef, putting it on a computer. So now a three-dimensional reef is put into a two-dimensional picture. And then we project randomly spots on that and identify what's underneath it. So it tells us what percentage of the bottom, when you force it into a two-dimensional form, is uh, living coral. So in a real basic sense, it allows us to measure change pretty well if there's more or less coral cover over years. But it doesn't necessarily identify or describe a reef that well because it doesn't really describe the complexity, the structural complexity, the three dimensions of the reef. But it does give us a good way to look at what's happening over time. And if real quick glance at this, um, this map, all the red sites are significantly declining in terms of coral cover from the first start of the data till the end um, in 2012. The black sites are staying statistically the same. Okay, there may be some changing, but it's not, you know, when you take into effect the variation from year to year, it's not significant statistically. The green site, the one green site is showing some increase. Um, and so you kind of get a sense of generally what's happening. Now, just to kind of illustrate, and I'll talk about all of these facts in more details tonight, is um, there's several things going on. Like Honolulu Bay, you look at a steady and fairly substantial decline. Sediment events is the most likely driver of that because every year, two, three years, you get a heavy rainfall event and a lot of dirt like that washing into the bay. And if it coincides with a time when there's not a whole lot of wave energy to move that dirt off, it'll have a direct impact on the reef. Nutrient stress, we talked about a bit. We'll go into more detail. Um, healthy reefs like uh, Molokini, I always use this as my example of a healthy reef, but when I show you the slides later on, there's also some examples of coral disease within there. Even though it's a healthy reef, there's a lot of coral. Coral disease we're finding actually tends to correlate somewhat with how much coral there is as well. So it's kind of like disease of people. In the cities, disease is spread a little quicker where the people are packed in. And in coral reefs, it's somewhat, somewhat similar. So, this is, so there's also some examples, even on our healthy reefs um, of coral disease. Crown of thorns predation, I'll talk a little bit about that. There's a really interesting event that occurred in 2005 in the Hii Canal. And then, um, Last, I'll use a couple examples of uh, full degradation of a coral reef. Uh, tonight will be the first time I show some time series photos of Papalula Point on the North Shore. Really kind of a, a amazing and quick transformation on that reef over the last few years. And not a good transformation. Okay, so Molokini is kind of a healthier reef system. It's insulated from the land-based pollution sources because it's out in the middle of a channel. It's a marine reserve, so fishing is not allowed, so fish stocks tend to be more natural, normal in that area. Coral cover is close to 80%, it's in the high 70%, and it doesn't change a whole lot in terms of coral cover from year to year. There is some examples of coral disease I'll show you, but for the most part, coral cover is staying right in that mid-70s or so. All right, so this is one section of the reef, and I, you know, I usually look for ones that have some interesting things going on. So it's not necessarily exactly what's happening all over the reef, but one of the thing, couple of things I want you to pay attention to here is even though I'm saying coral cover is not changing, you'll notice that the reef changes quite a bit. Some corals grow faster than others; they cause a lot of structure. You know, they come up and out and over. They'll overgrow other corals. So that kind of change is always happening on a healthy reef. And you want that because the other force that's also acting on reefs is erosion. From bio erosion, from critters out there, sea urchins and other little critters, to physical stress or physical erosion from waves and things of that sort. So you want your reef growing more than it's eroding. So you can see over time as we go, um, these plates of montipro or rice coral are growing out and up and overgrowing this big lobe coral that was on the base. You can still see the two cauliflower corals on the side growing as well. Right about here, notice these little spots showing up on the plates of, of rice coral. Okay, And from year to year, they're getting a little bit bigger. I'm sorry, that wasn't in focus that year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but here you can see some active um, coral disease continuing. So. 
so you know, just over that period of time that we showed, the rice coral grew really rapidly, quickly, up and out and over, and then died back fairly quickly. Um, we see a fair amount of examples at Molokini of coral disease. And any of you guys who go diving out there, you can kind of look for it. You'll see, I'll talk more about disease here too, but you'll see bright white areas where the coral tissue is recently gone. Um, and if you go back further, you'll see some algae growing because as after it's the coral skeleton has been exposed, after about a week, the seaweed's going to start to grow. And then you'll see right at the front leading edge is healthy coral tissue. Um, so that's kind of a sign that there's an active disease going on in the area. And we've noticed a little more lately out in Molokini. There's also been a lot of other high-profile disease outbreaks on Kauai, on Kaneohe Bay. Um, I'll talk about one in um, Ahi Canal in a little pond that just decimated this, this little pond's coral cover. So disease does happen. We're becoming much more aware of it. And I don't know if it's just our awareness and, and everybody's awareness that's making it you know, more obvious now, or if disease is becoming more prevalent. I think it's probably a little bit of both, um, but we'll see, we'll keep an eye on it. So coral disease, these are just examples of several different um, types of disease or deformities and things that they've pointed out. I won't go into it. Uh, if you guys, in fact, a good lecture for this um, making waves would be from one of my coworkers, Darla White, uh, who does, coral, does a lot of work with coral disease because she could fill a couple hours easily on <coughs> coral disease. But this is some graph I took from uh, Coral Reef Ecosystem Division of NOAA. And they go out with the cruise ships. You might see the, the, um, the old modified sub chasers of 220, 230 foot boats from time to time around the, the island. They're doing a bunch of different surveys. And when they do that, they can cover all of the coastline and do these rapid assessments. And here, you know, without going into a whole lot of detail, basically the size of these purple or blue circles dictates how much prevalence in terms of percentage of, the, of coral colonies are diseased. So what we're seeing is, for the most part, somewhere between 1% to 2% of the coral colonies of the reefs are all the way around Malawi, Lanai, and, and Molokai, it seems to be. So it's kind of a, that, that may be a good sense of what that baseline level of coral disease naturally is within the population. Um, of course, this is just rapid assessments. To really get a sense now, if we have a problem, is we have to continue to do these to see if that kind of prevalence of disease changes over time. I'll just give you some background to that. Anyway. Okay, the uh, one episode I hinted on was uh, in the Hee Canal, a place we called Montipra Pond. So I don't know if, if it, it's, this whole area is off limits now for the public, but if you guys were around and went out there before the, the uh, prohibition on going out there, there's little ponds on the southern end of the reserve. If you walk out kind of around the house out there. Um, and one of these ponds, my tipper pond, was just a small little pond and it was kind of isolated from the ocean. There would be water movement during high tides that would go in there. But for the most part, it was kind of distinct from the regular ocean. And it was filled with rice coral, just filled with it. And there was other similar ponds all around there that didn't have any rice coral. They didn't have any coral, they had zoanthids and things. But so this was just kind of a unique spot. And that's why it was titled Montipro Pond. And there was a lot of effort looking at monitoring what was going on. In um, January of 2010, they started to notice disease in the area. And because it's such a small little pond, it's highly likely that all of the coral in there was from one colony or very closely related colonies anyway. So there wasn't a whole lot of genetic diversity. There certainly wasn't a lot of different species. It was just one species of coral. So we started noticing this and um, kind of close up on it. What you're seeing, kind of like what I was talking about earlier, is you'll have your front line, disease front, which is really bright white. And that's where the coral has recently died. It's exposed to white skeleton. And as you go back away from that, you'll see progressively more seaweed or algae, perp algae growing on the skeleton. And if you move forward of it, you'll see the healthy coral with the pigmentation from the zooxanthellae. So you can see that really distinctly, and you can monitor the progress um, just by looking at the disease front. So in this case, one year following the outbreak, 47% of the coral cover in that pond was lost. And um, I don't know what the final numbers are two or three years later, but um, best I can 
best I recall from talking with Darwin, there's there's just a small fraction of coral still within the pond, especially compared to what used to be there. So in this case, that was a very drastic uh, disease outbreak. But again, I think exasperated by the fact that it was a small pond separated from the ocean currents and everything else, and most likely the coral was all related, if not the same colony. It made it a lot more um, susceptible to that kind of infection. Also in the Ahikanao area, we had a, an interesting event in 2005 where Chronothorn sea stars just kind of came marching into the, our study site. So we went out there to take our surveys in the, in the um, summer of 2005, and lo and behold, sea stars, the Chronothorn sea stars are everywhere. This is just one frame to give you a sense of it. Here's this uh, white slate is about the size of uh, regular paper, eight and a half by 11, maybe slightly bigger than that. And around there, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven or eight chronothorns just within that one frame. So they're kind of patchy. They're not all that densely distributed, but there are a lot of them. And this is kind of important because we get called a lot by people who kind of go snorkeling in an area a lot and they see a chronothorn sea star, they get all concerned. Um, they're natural. They're a normal part of the reef ecosystem. And normally if you see one, two or three or four maybe on a dive, no big deal. When you see eight of them in one small little section of reef, that's the kind of bloom that's a, a fairly substantial concern. Uh, but what was interesting with this is, is we had several years of data prior, which I'll show you, and then several years subsequent to that event. So we were able to, uh, to kind of get a sense of how the reef was affected by that chronothorn predation event and how it's uh, responded since. So in 2005 is when we first saw them. You can see about you know close to 50% decline in that one year. It continued down the next couple of years because the chronothorns moved into the shallow site. And this is actually a, um, this graph takes two sites in the area, a deep site at 30 feet and a shallow site at 10 feet, and just averages them together. <clears throat> so they ate everything in the deep and they moved into the shallow. And so you basically ended up substantial overall decline in coral cover in that area. Since then, it's continued up. And so now it's at 16% when it initially was up around 22 or so. So we're getting close. In fact, statistically, at this point, there's no difference between the start coral cover and the finishing coral cover. So the reef is almost, in terms of coral cover, recovered to its pre-predation state. However, what's kind of interesting is to look at the composition of coral on that reef. This 2004 here on the left is pre-predation um, from the crown of thorns. And notice about 50% of the coral is montipra. And so rice corals of different types. For the most part, there's two types out there that dominate, patula and uh, capitata. So the typical rice coral and then the one that's a little uh, flatter, smoother. And then there are a blue over here being the parietes, which is finger coral, lobe coral. And out in this area, there's also a lot of parietes roost that kind of grows in plates similar to um, uh, rice coral. That was making up maybe a little more than a quarter. So these are kind of the two dominant corals in the area. Uh, Fossilopora is your cauliflower coral. And in the shallow site, that's fairly abundant at the time. And the pavona is not that common in most of our reefs, but tends to be a little more common out here. Again, was making up, you know, maybe an eighth or close to, yeah, you know, probably about an eighth of the bottom. After the predation, the crown of thorns pretty much targeted Montipra and Pasilopora. That's their, their main, so the cauliflower coral and the rice coral, that's the main ones they target, just based on the uh, size of the polyps and the ease of getting at them and so forth. They avoid parietes for the most part. Parietes has real small polyps. Uh, apparently it's not worth their effort to try to feed on it. So you can see, and all this is is the percentage of coral in the different genera out of the total coral. Okay, so it always adds up to 100, but we're just looking at the total coral cover. So after the predation, it wasn't like more parietes was there, but the parietes was mostly all that was left. Most of the other stuff was fed on. And then what happened after that is it started to come back. Now about half of the reef is parietes, a quarter 
is Montipra again, and Pavona makes up almost a corn as well. So Montipra, which grows very quickly, outcompetes a lot of the other corals, can kind of dominate a reef over time and make that reef less resilient to stresses. However, events such as a, a very selective predation like the crown of thorns can change that balance and kind of maintain a more diverse and therefore a more resilient reef. So I, I think, you know, maybe a little too early to tell for sure what the lasting impacts of this are, but I think it's pretty clear evidence that even though we see this and we go, oh God, that's bad, it's destroying the coral, a lot of these events in nature and coral disease could be one as well, maybe kind of important in maintaining that balance and that diversity of the reef and helping the reef be more, you know, stronger and more resilient to future um, threats as well. <clears throat> On a little bang. Okay, so this is what we see every now and then. Okay, any of you folks who frequent the area or live in the area may have seen it in the past as well. You get heavy rainfall events, the lower portion of the, of the watershed is fairly vulnerable to erosion and tons and tons of sediment wash into that small little bay. During the winter when this usually happens and luckily during the winter there's usually also high surf in the area. That moves the sediment down into the middle of the bay and off the reef. However, every now and then the bay could be totally calm like this and you have an event like this and that has a fairly substantial impact on the coral. Take a look at an aerial photo and you get a sense of why sedimentation is bad in this area. One, it's a fairly steep um, area from mountain to the, to the ocean. The other is that over 100 years or so, it's been intensely used for agriculture. The tops of these ridges have been knocked down. Roads to get up to them run along these steep edges of the ravines and so forth. Uh, more recently, golf courses and high-end residential developments and the roads that go with that have made a lot more impervious areas move the water through a lot quicker as well. So clearly, you know, the years of these kinds of changes, golf courses, pineapple farming, residential developments, etc., have degraded the water quality of the bay. Um, but from our monitoring, we are measuring 42% down to 9%, so a fairly substantial decline. And it moves in these little pulses that tend to correspond with some of these big rainfall events. <clears throat> the most uh, obvious one that we documented was in 2005. Heavy rainfall event on the west side. You know, and these really aren't that unusual because West Maya Mountains, Kukukui, that area, is one of the wettest places in the world, right? They always argue whether, you know, Kauai, Mount Waiali is or over West Maui. But heavy rainfall events, especially during the winter, are fairly common. In this particular case, um, that upper residential area in Kapalua around the, the plantation golf course, they were doing road work, combining, connecting some of the areas together. Uh, the water just rushed through that exposed dirt down along these, these roads, broke off into the, one of the main channel or collection vents that goes into the bay and uh, a citizen actually observed this and documented it uh, and went up, followed it up to the construction site and you can see where all of those silt fences were just knocked down and all the mud was just washing away. Um, and lo and behold, we noticed about a 50% decline, particularly on the, on the south side of the reef as a result of that event. Uh, but this is what it looks like. On the south side of the reef, if you remember back 10 years or so, there was a fair amount of this purple rice coral, Montipra flavulata. And if any of you pay attention to coral, this is actually one that's uh, being uh, potentially listed as an, a threatened species. Uh, this one as well as Montipra patula, because uh, they're uh, more vulnerable to climate change and elsewhere in the, in the, in the Pacific and elsewhere in the world, I guess, they're numbers have declined substantially. But it's very bright uh, purple. And it shines and it's really obvious when you're on a shallow reef. And it, it usually thrives in a really shallow high wave energy area. Um, John Gorman probably remembers, I remember when I used to work at the Ocean Center that there's a lot of purple rice coral right here in Malaya as well in the shallow. Now there's very little. Um, probably have to hunt for it. But anyway, you can see uh, over time what happened on this section of reef is there wasn't a whole lot of change. 
Strikingly, even the label seemed to stay there from year to year. So it's just a little bold too. There's events where you can see, obviously, some sediment was put into the system. Uh, but the coral kind of hung out there until one year, 2005, when it completely disappeared. All the purple rice coral on that reef almost disappeared. And after that, you notice now that, that coral was kind of stabilizing that section of the reef. Now you notice the sea urchins and stuff are really pitting it out, starting to erode it a lot more. So structurally it changed a lot once that, that little bit of coral disappeared from it. And you just expand that to that entire south reef and a lot of changes occurred because of that sediment event. Purple rice coral is, because it's evolved to live in these shallow high wave energy areas, it doesn't have a lot of uh, defenses to sediment. Whereas the one coral that hung in here, which is the Lobata coral, Piranhas Lobata, has a, a really good uh, response to sediment where it extrudes a lot of, of uh, mucus and kind of sloughs the sediment off. And so it, you, you'll find Lobata coral growing in harbors and all kinds of uh, bays and areas where there's a lot of sediment. They're pretty well adapted to that. Okay, so this leads us to problems with land-based pollution. Um, and this is one of the major concerns where people live. In this case, I'm going to talk about nutrients. The red locations are areas where several years back we did surveys and we found that the seaweed, the algae, was greater than 30% of the bottom. So these were kind of hot areas that we identified. There's a lot of seaweed growing in those areas, smothering the reef. So we had to kind of go back and ponder and scratch our heads and go, well, what's going on in these areas? And lo and behold, with my high-tech GIS skills, I could draw out where the people live on the island. Kaului Waluku, Malaya, Kihei, Lahaina, up to Kapalua. This is where there's kind of high, dense, urban um, areas, and particularly right up next to the shoreline. You can also kind of contemplate, well, what's going on in the central part of the island? And there's a lot of monoculture, agriculture, fairly intense agricultural operation, sugarcane. And so you can think, well, a lot of the groundwater is moving into these areas, Malaya, into Kalui, and so forth, and that's likely having an effect. But also where there's people, there's sewage. And currently, the county of Maui in, in uh, Lahaina, I mean, in Kihei, Lahaina, and Kaolui run sewage treatment plants, treat the, treat the water to a fairly high level, but then dispose of it into injection wells, which are basically the definition of an injection well is a hole in the ground that's deeper than it is wide. Okay. Uh, county injection wells are actually good compared to a lot of injection wells like the ones in Malaya. Um, some of them go 300 feet or so down into the ground. They're small and they have diffuse things that are supposed to spread that wastewater out. But generally, these areas are near the shoreline. The groundwater is mostly brackish or salt when you get down that low. The, the wastewater is fresh and it bounces right up to the top of the water table. And this has been speculated and proved uh, recently. So it's on the top of the water table and, and that's what interfaces with the, the ocean. So basically you get your springs of groundwater that come up right near shore, usually waist deep, up to 10 feet or so. And you guys go snorkeling or diving a lot, we'll see that as the blurry fresh water coming up. You'll see that all around the island. <clears throat> but in areas where you have these injection wells, that displaces the normal groundwater. So all that volume of water that goes down pushes the groundwater away, and, and what comes out on the shoreline from that plume is pretty much all the wastewater that's put, put in the ground. So, you know, it depends. Some are better than others. Kihei actually reuses a lot of their wastewater, I think over half of it. And they're about a mile away from the coastline, so the impact is a little more diffuse, not as intense. At Kaikili, we'll talk a little bit more about, but we found recently that that comes out in a very small area right near Kaikili Beach Park. Um, Kaului, we don't know exactly where it comes out, but our current mayor, former uh, wastewater operator, talks about seeing it during low tide bubble right out of the, um, the sand at the, at the shoreline. So likely it is coming up in springs right there near the sewage treatment plant. And, you know, out in that shallow area as well. 
So thank Healy Beach. We went out there with jet ski and a bunch of salinity measures and other things, and we did some real quick mapping out to find out where the fresh water comes up. And the blue, dark blue spots are where there's a lot of fresh water. Those of you familiar with the area know the one on the left, on the bottom of the screen is, is kind of a drainage canal that free flows with the current with the uh, pine. It drains the pond from the um, golf course. So there's a lot of fresh water, obviously, that's coming out from that area. The other one is right next to slightly um, slightly north of Kaikili Beach Park. There ain't no, there's no stream, there's no obvious thing there. So basically what you're looking at would be the equivalent of an underwater stream. A lot of water coming up, percolating up into the shoreline right in that area. Kind of through a couple lines that will show generally where we see a lot of fresh water input. Several years back, a researcher by the name of Megan Naylor working for UH Botany, started to look at nitrogen uh, ratios within seaweed. So she'd collect seaweed, chop it up, dry it, send it off to a lab, and they would analyze the ratio of a nitrogen isotope, which is called N15, in relation to normal nitrogen, which is N14. So a lot of um, elements will have isotopes as well. But what happens is when there's a lot of bacterial activity, breaking down organic matter and releasing nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, it skews that ratio. So wastewater and any other kind of animal waste will have a lot of bacteria breaking down the organic matter and it's going to elevate that N15 ratio. So it's a really good way to tell if your nutrients are coming from wastewater, could be a cattle farm, you know, feedlot, piggery or some kind of a, a biological waste process or fertilizers because fertilizers don't have that elevated sig signal so she did that she found uh, elevated signals down in this end in particular particularly at this whole area the highest down here on the uh, southern end and these were higher than ever found anywhere in the literature for people doing this work so it's kind of like oh, okay what's going on there she then put algae out into the environment at different depths and different heights in the water column to kind of model that shown from the dark blue here kind of drew a circle around that and lo and behold 10 some years prior because there was a beach park there and parking and a nice shower for us to use when we got out of the water we had set up our long-term coral monitoring sites so we're measuring this this rapid decline and lo and behold as we started to learn more and more we realized that that is where a lion's share of the wastewater from the um, injection wells in, in West West Maui is coming up in a small little area right there. And then the currents take it south. So pretty good sign that that could be one of the drivers of the decline that we're measuring in that area. And this is what the reef looks like. Uh, just make note there is still some complexity on the reef. Over the years there's fairly substantial blooms of algae. Uh, a lot of the coral has been smothered out and died. Even these large globe corals, one just fell off and was replaced with a little cauliflower coral there. Interesting that cauliflower was growing fairly nicely there for a while and then got a little bigger and died. And that globe coral fell off. So you can see just basically in a stressed reef, there's still coral there, there's still some structure. But over time, a lot of this is dying, a lot of the big low corals are getting smaller and smaller, and the reef just is not nearly as, as healthy and as structured, complex as it used to be. Kind of comparing them over time, from the start to the end. One of the main concerns when this happens, as I already talked about, is we lose reef complexity the structured three-dimensional habitat fish like. So if you step back and you look at a reef, you can see that it's big mounds, a lot of cracks and crevices, a lot of place for the little critters to live. When that starts to die back, you know, the reef, which may have been up here at one point, just comes more flat, featureless, uh, no longer supports near the amount of, of biological diversity that it wants to. And that's a, a major concern we have. Um, Akula Point is, is a new example of a reef that has we've monitored from fairly good condition not great but a fairly good condition as it's collapsed to um, a fairly degraded reef 
So in 1999, you can see a lot of this purple rice coral. When you jumped in the water, it's about 30 to 35 feet deep. You jumped in the water, that bottom just sh would shine purple. It was really kind of an interesting reef, not like much of anything else I've seen. Um, and there's some other low coral, and here's a, here's a nice um, chunk of lobata. So over time, you see a little more algae. You can see the coral kind of um, changing a bit. Thing's interesting this big low coral that seems immune to it a lot now is being covered by different species of seaweed in any of the spaces that are open could be just started from a little snapping shrimp crack or hole and this is 2012. anybody who's into um, phycology study of algae kind of gets into that this is a great place to dive though not so much a nice coral reef but the diversity of, of algae out here is like nothing i've seen you know, the abundance and the diversity. You got, just in this picture, you got Asparagopsis. Uh, local folks like to collect that. Uh, uh Really spicy, kind of sharp flavor. There's a chunk of uh, Lipoa right here. I like that in my poke. That's uh, not as strong as Uh And there's several other species of algae just in this one picture. So the, the productivity that's in this area coming up through the ground, apparently, is just really spurring a lot of algae growth. And I'm not quite sure what changed in the time frame where we were monitoring, um, but there has been a lot of really heavily targeted spear fishing, a lot of it at nighttime, um, scuba spear fishing off of these reefs where they, you know, when this is at 30 foot depth, but as it gets a little further off, it drops down fairly rapidly. And that reef then becomes really structured. A lot of fish life out there. Um, and I've noticed a lot of people have noticed a lot of effort, commercial fishing effort, put on on this reef over the last several years. Uh, so that could that could help you know, explain it. Maybe the herbivory is less than it used to be. Which leads us to fish. And hopefully you're not falling asleep yet. This fish is what I actually really like. I'm not that big a coral person, but I spend a lot of time looking at coral. Uh, so obviously, a healthy fish populations play a critical role in the overall coral reef ecosystem health. This is pretty obvious to most of us now, because we understand they play a role, they feed, everything's got its checks and balances. Uh, but it's still kind of a, a cultural change within agencies like mine to move away from this concept of, my, of fisheries, which was either looking for more fisheries to exploit or managing fisheries that are being exploited by only considering that fish species or that stock. You know, that's traditional fisheries. That's the way we've always done it. It's really a cultural change now to start thinking about the ecosystem as a whole and what role these animals play and what level of fish biomass and of different species do you need to maintain a healthy reef. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of catch data from commercial fishing. It may not be perfectly accurate. Fishermen are required to submit it, but nobody's really looking over their shoulder to make sure they do it accurately. And there's probably some incentives for underreporting, especially if they're selling things for cash and don't want to pay Uncle Sam. So from 1948 or so on, we've been collecting these data from fishermen's catch reports. Prior to that, you notice a big window where there was no data being collected. And in the 1900s, there was a fairly extensive study done actually intercepting fishermen, talking to them, looking at their catch, and compiling all of this. Um, and they estimated catch in that 1900 period as being fairly high, close to um, at least over three and a half million pounds, and these are coastal species. By the time we started collecting data in the, in the late 40s, early 50s, we were down you know, a third or less of that. And it's just important, I think, to kind of put things in context. You know, we argue, we, we kind of complain a bit about how our stock, fish stocks are less, there's less fish than there used to be five, 10, 15 years ago. But look at what it probably was 100 years ago uh, and, and understand that a lot of the change has occurred a long time ago. And now we're gonna start trying to correct those wrongs and bring it back. It's not, not gonna be easy. And it's unlikely we're ever gonna get back to the levels it was, but at least that kind of puts things 
you know, in somewhat of a context. Uh, and that's important because when we look at things like this, we often are affected by shifting baseline. You know, it's, it's so much fish less now than there was when I was a kid that I remember. But what it was when I was a kid was just a fraction of what it was once was, but I never knew that, right? So as each generation goes, our standard, what we expect, gets less and less. And that's a, a concern uh, for fisheries resources. The other thing that we do a lot of is we go out and we do fisheries independent assessments, which basically means it's not related to fishing. It's going out and censusing, counting fish. We use different methods, but most of them are some form of transect where we swim along a, a prescribed area on the reef, either with a line or just on a heading, and we count fish within a certain width in front of us. So we're not counting everything. That would be too hard to do. But we're counting, you know, on one section of reef, we can then say how much biomass, how much weight of fish are out there per unit area. And that's described several ways, but the common one is grams per meter square. Um, in a lot of studies, it's the same people doing it. This one, this is just several of us from different islands, but we're using the same methods and the same uh, units to compare. We can then look at different sites and try and figure out what the fish stocks are here versus there and why that could be. Key here is the big islands over here, a lot less people, a lot of uh, a rugged coastline, uh, much better fish stocks. Lanai, fewer people, rugged coastline, much better fish stocks. You get to Maui, our marine reserves tend to be up here, and then we get to our more open areas and there's a steady decline. Um, so fishing is a, is a major driver of this. Um, key things, parrotfish biomass in the orange here. Healthy reefs tends to be well in excess of 10 grams per meter square. <clears throat> reefs that are not so well, they're down less than two to one or so. And, and that's a key thing we look at. What levels do you need on healthy reefs? And is that a threshold that we need to maintain to prevent our reefs from collapsing? Uh, this is a study done by um, NOAA Coral Reef Ecosystem folks. And basically they're on the cruise ship. They're going around the entire uh, main Hawaiian islands. They also, with the same crew, same methods, do these surveys in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. They then can compare it based on population near the coastline. So here we're just looking at biomass, grams per meter squared, in relation to how populated the area is. Oahu gets its own category, very populated. Populated areas elsewhere in the state, a little better than Oahu. Moderately populated areas, you know, might be like Haiku, Paia, something like that, a little better. And then remote inaccessible areas, quite a bit better. Good news, over 50%, 57% fall into those two categories that have the highest biomass. Bad news, even the best of our best pales in comparison when you compare it to an area where fishing is not allowed and that tends to be fairly remote or isolated from human impacts. Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, about three times, maybe a little more than three times higher biomass. Notice the majority of the biomass is apex predators removed fairly quickly when fishing is happening in an area, right? Because these are the guys going after your baits and so forth. Uh, and they're, but they're also heavy, so that makes up a lot of the biomass. Even with all these predators, and these are reef predators, you know, reef sharks, luas, things of that sort. Even with all of them, your goat fish and wrasses, your secondary consumers, and your herbivores, primary consumers, are higher than the best of our remote inaccessible areas in the main Hawaiian Islands. So again, this is just, you know, I'm not saying we're gonna have fish stocks the same as the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, but it gives us a benchmark that gets us away from that sliding baseline. Now we have a way of saying, well, what, what should it look like if it's not affected? There is no fishing. There is no human impacts in the area, or very little. There is human impacts. There's marine debris is a big problem in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, but at least fishing and, and other kinds of uses are, are fairly, are not allowed. That same study by CRED, they went ahead and, and, plot, and pulled out targeted fish versus non-targeted fish. And what that simply means is fish that people are trying to catch to eat versus fish that people don't want. You think of things that people don't want, parrot, you know, puffer fishes, maybe some of the wrasses, little damsel fish, things like that, versus the fish people want, you know, big parrot fish, you know, big certain fish, kala, uh, manini, things of that sort. 
When you do that, you plan it by increasing human population. You can see the targeted fish has a direct decline with more people. Non-targeted fish does not. Key here is one of the big arguments is, is it overfishing or is it pollution that's causing the drop? Okay? And if it was pollution, therefore habitat destruction, you would expect a very similar trend with all fish, not just fish that are targeted. Um, so this, this shows fairly good solid evidence that overfishing is one of the major drivers anyway of the decline in our fish biomass. Another thing that's important is the size of fish. Fishing often targets or the fish themselves as they get bigger are quicker to go after baits and hooks. So we end up with smaller fish stocks and, and a lot of times conservation minded fishing has driven this concept that take fewer but take only the really big one, right? Just go for the big guy, but leave the small ones alone. Even our regulations tend to support that. We have minimum sizes, so the fish get to a certain size, but then anything goes after that. Um, but what we know now, and, and what we've known for a long time, is that larger female fish produce exponentially more eggs, and those eggs are much better able to survive and turn into larvae that will survive and recruit out the fish. So this one uh, omelu here, 25 inches, is equivalent from a reproductive point of view. So 86, yes, 86, 13 inch omelu. And that's because a 13 inch omelu, when it first starts to reproduce, produces about 50,000 eggs a year. But the 25 inch one produces 4 million. So twice the size, but not twice the egg output, exponentially more eggs. Uh, and this is just one good example, and I like the Omilu one is one, uh, we'll talk briefly here in a little bit about upcoming management efforts, but we are um, in the process of, of, of proposing some new fishing rules and regulations, and one of them will be a maximum size for Omilu. So it'll, it'll, be, it'll be managed in what we call a slot limit. So a minimum size, you can't take them. Once it reaches that size, you can take them. Then it reaches a maximum size, you can no longer take them. This is the first time in the state of Hawaii that we're actually going to be proposing and hopefully getting past this kind of management um, effort. And the reason is, here is a non-fish population in northwestern Hawaiian Islands. It has what we call a bell-shaped normal curve. You know, there's a certain amount here of small ones, a certain amount here of big ones, and then most of them are kind of in the middle. In this population, there's about 20% of the omilu are larger than 2 feet, or 60 centimeters. In the main Hawaiian Islands, is less than 8%. In fact, other data I've seen had it more like 3 to 4% that are larger than 60 centimeters. And most of them fall in this small to middle size. So you can see, we call it skewed. It's kind of skewed to the smaller sizes. That's very typical of a, of a heavily fished population. Uh, the problem with this is that even in a healthy population like here, the majority of the reproductive output occurs right in this area kind of right in this um, 24 to 30 inch size. We don't have very many at all in the main Hawaiian Islands of that size, so we basically have poised, this, this population is kind of poised for collapse. And fishermen want to target the big ones. If they see a big one, that's the ones they want, uh, oftentimes because of this trophy mentality. Uh, it's not necessarily all fishermen in that way, there's a lot there's a big component of the population that tends to be more subsistence. And they may not like the big ones because they don't taste as good. But a lot of the people out there nowadays fishing are actually targeting trophies. And they feel, I think, you know, as long as we've been talking about it for a long time, but they're still kind of that in, deeply ingrained that that's the conservation way of doing it. So we got to kind of change that mindset and get them to understand that actually you're better off to leave these big ones. That's the better thing to do and take some of the smaller ones. Just doing a really quick fisheries modeling assessment, Dr. Alan Friedlander, who we work a lot with, fisheries co-op unit at UH, um, kind of assess the, the, what we call a maximum sustainable yield kind of approach of fisheries management. And, you know, I don't have a good graph for this, but basically you have a bell curve and there's a, a peak of that is your maximum biomass that can be sustained. Okay? And so if you fish that down below that biomass, it's called, the fishery is called overfished. You overfish the biomass below its, its sustainable level. And if your fishing effort is at such a level that you're going to drive it past that biomass down to a point where it collapses, that's termed overfishing. 
And so you can have a population where you're overfishing, you can make some adapt management changes and prevent it from becoming overfished. And that's usually the effort. Federal fisheries management like deep sea bottom fish uses that model a lot. In this case, we have Promilu based on the data we've collected, not just from visual censuses, but also from catch report. We have a fishery that's both overfished and being overfished, or overfishing is occurring. So, you know, if the feds were managing this, they would shut it down for 10 years. For us, we're, you know, it, Omigo is this really important, culturally important, and recreationally important papilla fishery. Uh, it's also a part, you know, important recreational for spear fishers and whatnot. We're hoping to at least get slot limits in there as a measure to try and protect it for the future. But we need public support to move any of these things forward. And that leads us to where we go from here. Um, the Kaikili site was an example of monitoring data, driving management. We noticed substantial declines. And so we decided to use fisheries management, protecting herbivores, as a tool to help protect or help the reef recover and do better. To me, it, it kind of seems like a no-brainer. Uh, fish eat seaweed, seaweed's a problem, protect the fish eat the seaweed. But this is the first time in Hawaii, for sure, and from what I understand, pretty much anywhere in the world, where this direct fisheries management approach was taken to help protect the coral itself. Um, and so basically, the fish eat the seaweed, the coral becomes uh, healthier and more resilient to change in the future. This area went into effect in July 2009. I have some handouts and things in the back corner back here. One of them is a flyer for an upcoming birthday bash at Kaikili to celebrate uh, the, the implementation of this, uh, this uh, management area. So uh, July 28th, Sunday, will be the fourth year birthday for the establishment of this uh, management area. Real simple. You're not allowed to take any of three families of fish, parrotfish family, surgeon fish, and the chubs of any nui. You're not allowed to take any sea urchins either. You can also not allow to feed fish. So this is a tourist area, people like to feed fish. You feed the fish, you fill them up, they no longer have, want to eat the seaweed. The other um, activities that are specifically allowed, and this is important because this is one of the ways we gained a lot of support, broad support, is we wanted to continue to allow fishing, particularly encourage fishing, but just not for these three families of fish or sea urchins. So if the, if the reef health improves, fishing for other types of fish, the secondary consumers and the apex predators and so forth, should improve as well. And fishermen as a stakeholder in the area should see the benefit as well. Um, and we really wanted to encourage that. It wasn't about anti-fishing. It was about specifically protecting certain species that were important on the reef. Um, and with that, it's, it's allowed specifically that you can attract fish using bait and things. We didn't want to have fishermen get in trouble because of the fish feeding provision. So pretty simple rule. Um, the question now is, is it working? And everybody wants to know one year later, is it working? <laughs> okay. uh, first off, we got to get compliance. It's taken us a long time, a lot of community involvement to try to build awareness, build compliance with the rules. Not a whole lot of enforcement out there. Not that many guys, and they're not based in Lahaina. So it's hard to make enforcement cases, but as there's more awareness, people become more educated, they're less likely to, um, to break the rules. The last time we did an assessment, compliance was about, there was about 20% non-compliance. So there's still about one out of every five spear fishermen anyway who were taking um, certain fish and, and pair fish and so forth. Hopefully that's improved, we'll have to do some more assessments in the future. In terms of biology, Surgeon fish is not really showing much of anything. There was a lot, the, the Kaikili graph is the blue one. There was a little more in that area of surgeon fish than in open reference areas prior to the closure. But I think you can see the variability in these large uh, air bars. I think there was just, during our surveys, there was a lot of big schools that we encountered those couple of years. That's then mellowed out and it's been more or less consistent with the open areas terms of surgeon fish. So although this may seem depressing, it's not unexpected. Surgeon fish are slow growing. They take about five years to actually mature to adults from recruits. And then oftentimes, some of them, the larger ones, live to be 30 years or more. 
as adults. So the population is going to take a while to recover from fishing. We wouldn't expect to see a big uh, change for probably at least 10 years. Parrotfish, however, grow quicker. And uh, um, the nice thing here is that we've seen a fairly substantial increase where parrotfish were, were much lower than they should have been prior to the closure, have increased steadily to almost three times the level they were uh, just in a few years. So that's really a good sign. When we look a little closer, the dominant species is the bullethead parrotfish, um, Spilurus. You know, they get to be about a foot and a half max size. Most of them are around a, less than a foot. So they're a smaller species, but they're dominant on reefs like that. In the early years, there wasn't any larger than 30 centimeters or one foot showing up in our surveys. But in, in subsequent years after the protection and after a few years of time, you can see that that bell curve is filled in. The smaller bullet heads have moved in and grown into the larger size classes. And this would be very consistent with a protection effect. So whereas before they were being speared when they got bigger, now they're being left alone and you're seeing them fill in in that role. So the babies are growing up to be the adults and those are all bullethead parrotfish is what they look like. More importantly in terms of reef ecosystem is where there's more parrotfish, we see a real clear correlation with more crustal coral and algae, CCA, the purple and the pink stuff. That's the stuff that glues the reef together and it's the landing pad for the coral recruits. So that's a good sign when we're looking for a, a resilient reef, that we have more of that crustal squirrel and algae, less of that macroalgae, you know, the, the seaweed uh, growing on the bottom. I think some of the more important positive signs is really the acceptance and the support from the community. You know, generally when we have proposed regulations or marine managed areas where you weren't able to do what you used to be able to do in an area, it was um, not well supported. But the community has really stepped up in this area. And a lot of the uh, things like Makai Watch and citizen science activities are really well attended. A lot of people are getting out there participating in events, cleanups, snorkeling, uh, fish surveys. Makai Watch being coordinated to help educate the public about the area and help improve our compliance. Uh, a lot of um, involvement in that. Birthday bashes every year. Again, this one's coming up on um, July 28th. More and more people coming out, learning about the area, learning about why we have that area and why it's important. And so this is, to me, this is some of the more important um, signs of success. Just the awareness and the acceptance and, and the willingness of people to get involved. The other thing is that for years and years and years, we've got out, we propose fishing regulations because we can. It's well within our jurisdiction. We need to do something. We want to do what we can, right? Whereas a lot of the public has said, but what about pollution? What about our watersheds and the problems from the watersheds? What are you doing about that? And these are huge issues. This is the West Maui watershed. The area we're talking about is from here to over here, right? But this is upslope. And you can see it's a fairly rapid decrease from the mountain ridge to the, to the reef area. But also this um, effects of 100 years or more of, of uh, turkane and pineapple and so forth, most of which is no longer active. So these fields are fallow. And it's dry, so there's not much growing on them. And there's a big drainage areas because when it rains, it rains hard. And a lot of water comes down this slope and washes with it a lot of dirt. So there's these huge impacts from the watershed. There's the wastewater treatment plant we talked about and the water and wastewater that's injected and coming up there as well. Well, in 2010, because of the management effort and because of public awareness, our division, Division of Aquatic Resources, nominated or, or picked this as one of two priority sites to funnel coral reef management money into understanding the reef, helping protect and manage the reef, but also starting to look at the watershed issues. More importantly, in 2011, the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force, which is a, a major task force with representatives from the upper levels of all the federal uh, departments that have anything whatsoever to do with coral reefs, or potentially could, meets and discusses and it tries to direct agency resources and, and money and personnel to certain areas 
regarding coral reefs, they picked West Maui as the priority watershed of the Pacific. So that put a lot of international, well, national for certain, but also international emphasis on West Maui and what they can do to help that watershed. 2012, the state actually signed a memorandum of agreement to work together with the Army Corps to plan for kind of a cohesive uh, watershed management of the area. We also hired, um, through this process, a coordinator, Tova Callender, who's in the audience somewhere hiding. Um, and she's working with landowners and agencies and whatnot to kind of just collaborate, pull people together, and get projects going, identify areas where we can do things, and start to get everybody working together to actually do some, some on the ground management of the watershed. This is huge, okay? It's gonna take a long time to have an effect, but at least we're starting to do it. We've just talked about it previously. I, I haven't seen meaningful watershed management around Maui until, until we started this process here. So that's a big success. But the other is fishing regulations. I just saw actually next week, Friday, I'll be pre uh, presenting in front of the board a set of proposed fishing regulations. These are fairly substantial. They're taking into effect public concern as well as uh, the concepts of ecosystem services and what species we need to have on a reef. And we're proposing um, changes to size limits and bag limits of many popular uh, targeted species of fish. This is gonna be for Maui and Lanai, okay? And again, it's based on the resources from our monitoring, based on the best available science. But even more so than that, there's been like, you know, since 2009, two years or so, of really in-depth scoping with communities and fishermen, commercial fishermen and whatnot, to really get a sense of what people would support. So I'm hopeful that we support for this. I'm hopeful that all of you as well can uh, come out and get involved in helping move this forward, or at least providing your input. To quickly summarize, some of Maui's coral reefs are in trouble. Many of them are. Problems that are common, invasive algae, which is fueling off of nutrients, right? Poor water quality along our coastline related to nutrients, invasive algae, lots of microbes, also sediments from the land. Reduced fish numbers and decreased grazing pressure as a result of that. Smaller fish, which are likely resulting in less reproductive output because they're not as successful in reproduction as bigger fish. And then just general overuse and all of the things that go with having a lot of people in an area using the resource or interacting with the resource in one way or another. Some reefs are doing well. Healthy reefs require good water quality, clean water, healthy fish and vertebrate populations, all of the, the components of that ecosystem working together. Sustainable low human use, reducing the impacts from having too much people out there, being a little more careful with what we do and how we interact. Some coral reef disturbances can be good, and this is something you just have to kind of bear in mind because people freak out when they see things happen. Um, a few years back, there was some heavy surf that came from a different direction and decimated some of the reefs of Molokini. People were really concerned about that, but it's a natural event, okay? And the areas that were hit hard often are hit hard, and the, and the coral composition in that area reflects that. So it comes back, you know, and, and may get hit again, and that's going to kind of those kind of physical forces are going to determine things. Crown of thorns, people, you know, view this as a, as a plague and a real bad thing. And in some areas, it can be really bad, depending on the coral composition. Uh, but in Hawaii, I think crown of thorns were actually uh, well, intermittent high surf events with crown of thorn predation. I think they're actually probably a good thing, as long as they don't happen too frequently. You know, and that's one of the keys. If these blooms happen, every 30, 40 years, they probably help stimulate and maintain a, a diverse reef. If they happen every five years, they may decimate the reef, okay, or change it. So, so that's an important component of it, as well as the frequency. And then, I, you know, I mentioned earlier coral disease. As we learn more and more about it, maybe some background level of coral disease is an important part of this process as well. Most coral reef disturbances, however, are bad, particularly ones that we can tie directly to human impacts, right? So a lot of nutrients, a lot of sediment in the area could be a bad thing. Physical disturbances from, oh, you know, one example, guys dropped a plane in Laihu the other day, right? 
Uh, obviously, they didn't mean to. They were trying to salvage it with a helicopter, but poor planning or whatever, and that thing fell in the water, broke up, rolled around, probably damaged some coral. Coral, you know, incidents where it's boats sink. Obviously, people don't mean that, but it has real direct impacts on the reef. Some things that can be easily changed is, is how we anchor our vessels or secure our vessels, just taking more care. But physical damages are bad, and you know, disease often is is a uh, it's a sign of that. Coral disease could be a sign of it. We don't know at this point. Certainly, turtle disease seem to be more related to poor water qualities. Uh, fish disease is something we're seeing more of now as well. You might see fish with tumors or lesions on them. These things are, are probably signs that we're messing with the system and, and it's getting to a point where it's not as healthy for these organisms as it once was. Just a kind of a key thing to remember, uh, these ecosystems have taken hundreds of years to develop, kind of get in balance with the, the, the uh, things that are affecting them. Some natural coral reefs could have high background nutrients, depending on where they're at but they've evolved in that situation. It's taken hundreds of years to kind of meet that balance, but they can be permanently damaged or changed in just a few years, or in a few seconds, really, depending on the situation. So um, what we do is, is really important. I want to just bear that in mind for reefs for the future. Things that can be done. First, simplest, but often not done, is just to become educated and get aware. And so I applaud all of you just for coming and listening to me ramble tonight, because that's that's one of the first steps anyway, find out what's going on. Uh, from there, I hope you can go out and spread the word, let others know, um, educate people about various things when you have the opportunity. Demand that your elected representatives make the marine environment a priority. This is key, because they respond to the public. They don't respond to me. They don't respond to other scientists who I work with usually. They respond to the public in force. Um, and that's what we really need to get to the point where the public's willing to, to uh, band together and let our elected officials know that this is a priority and they need to put resources and money into it uh, to help the reefs. Get involved in the process. It's a public process. We have a lot of meetings. When we do the um, regulated species rules, I'll, have to, I'll be required to hold public hearings. Okay, and that's a fun thing, one of the most fun things I do in my job. I'll sit up there and, and listen to everybody tell us what idiots we are and how we don't know what we're doing. Um, and we'll say, thank you, next. Next one will come up. But um, that's the process. We record all of this information. It's transcribed, it's given to the policymakers so that they can see what the views of the public does. This is a public hearing. So all of these people who agree and go, oh, it's about time, but you know, my show is on TV tonight, or, or you know, I got a PTA meeting, or whatever. Everybody's very busy. Who don't come to the meeting, though, their, cons their, their views are not heard. And we generally hear from the people who are against or most um, passionate about what's going on. So get involved in that. Volunteer. There's a lot of marine stewardship programs. Specific Whale Foundation has a lot. Uh, you know, there's just Hawaii Wildlife Fund. There's uh, uh, Coral International, Project Sea Link, there's Makai Watches, and all kinds of things nowadays out there. The Hawaii Humpback Whale Sanctuary has a good volunteer program. The Natural Area Reserve at the Eve Canal has a volunteer program. There's all of these things where you guys can get out, help educate the public and the visitors and others, um, and, and hopefully make a difference as we move forward. And then help us with um, violations and enforcement. There's only a few enforcement guys. Um, last count, maybe 14 for the entire island, but they cover not just fishing, they cover hunting, land, state land issues, um, you name it. They have a huge, huge mandate of things to enforce. They can't be out there at all times. So they need us to be their eyes and ears. They need us to educate people who don't know the rules, and they need us to report violations. So simple to remember phone number 643-DLNR. Uh, you can report violations. If that's not manned, I would call the uh, police department. There's a non-emergency number. I can't remember right off the top of my head what it is. Um, but you could use 911. They might get a little upset with you. But <laughs> <laughs> Either way, if you can get to them, let them know. They can contact enforcement or send some of their guys out as well. So just, you know, 
be aware of what the rules and regulations are first so that you can then help um, be our eyes and ears out there. And that's it. Whew. Whole hour and a half almost. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if people want to stay later, but that leaves five minutes anyway until the schedule <laughs> time for questions. Yeah. Honolulu Bay was uh, established as a marine protected area in 1978. Uh, the plantation started in 1800 something. Uh, most of the damage and change to the of the area probably occurred in the early 1900s but we've attempted to work with the landowners recently to, to make changes unfortunately you know Maui Land and Pine is I think close to complete bankruptcy I mean they've they've shut down their farming operations they've laid off the majority of their staff they're pretty much trying to just use some of their land holdings for for real estate and things of that sort to stay afloat they really didn't have the money or the desire to do much when they pulled out. I think I think they wanted to, and I would have liked to see some way of forcing it. It sure seems like they should have, but the reality is a lot of that area is still affected. And now it's the development that's the threat. You know, the the changing of that area to golf courses and high end developments, the roads and everything. We've we work with the county during the process, the planning process. Um, tried to just see if we couldn't get policies in place to at least prevent large-scale grading in an area like that during the winter, you know, which should seem like a no-brainer. Um, I'd like to see that. I'd like to say that that was successful, but I haven't seen a lot of changes. So. Uh, over at the point there. Uh, yeah, the, the president of Palau came and spoke. He said that 95% uh, of the island nation of Palau is now a no-take area all the way out to the 200-mile uh, economic zone. And yet here in, in Maui, we got less than 1% of all of our uh, shoreline is protected. We got Ahihi and Honolulu Bay, and we got Holokini and uh, Manali Bay. But uh, isn't it just a matter of promulgating administrative rules? You can, you can pick the most delicate uh, coral reefs that we have, mm -hmm. and maybe maybe do just 5% uh, into uh, no take, I mean, no take areas, no, no, uh, no spear gunning, no line fishing, no net fishing, and no, uh, you know, aquarium fishing, and just save the, just 5%, just would that be? Well, it, it, I wish it was just a matter of promulgating rules. It sounds simple when you say it that way, but, uh, you know, again, it's a public process, and when we do the hearings and stuff, we gotta have support. And marine protected, no tape, marine protected areas are not supported by the majority of the people who come to the hearings right now. That's just the simple truth to the matter. So, and that promulgates up to stress at the legislature and our policymakers. They don't want to go there. So right now, the kind of the, the the way that we're focusing is on working with communities and having them come up with marine managed area rules that they they support, that they feel is important for their community. And it's one way where I'm no, we're noticing more and more effort to create marine managed areas. Not necessarily no take areas, but at least areas that are managed at a much higher level than they currently are. Um, if we wanted, and I think we, personally I think, and most of my scientific colleagues agree, that we should have a well thought out no series or, or, or kind of a network of no take marine areas as an insurance policy at the very least, but also to protect some reefs that are particularly vulnerable to um, the increasing stresses of global climate change, etc. If that was going to happen in, in a way where it was carefully thought out and we thought about which areas are most important and how they're linked to other areas for larval distribution and so forth, it would have to be mandated by the legislature. Our agency would not be able to go out there one by one through administrative rules and create these. We'd just get killed. There's no way. So the legislature would have to say, thou shall create 5, 10, 15, 20 percent, no take areas in consultation with the community. 
then the if would be off the table and we could work with the communities to best figure out where to put them. Really, I think that's the only way we would get to that. So how we get there, a lot of public pressure on the state legislators, your representatives and your senators uh, to, to move something like that forward. Uh, I snorkel South Maui uh, three, four days a week, and in the past 12 months, uh, my snorkel partner and I have noticed uh, an alarming number of kayak tour companies coming, and um, we've seen, uh, you know, very large coral heads with uh, Hawaiian dissolus above them. Those are getting wrecked, uh, um, and uh, now. We don't even go to Chang's anymore. Uh, Chang's, forget it. Uh, and so, what uh, is is that totally unregulated? The, um, and what can be done to? I mean, soon no one will want to come because it's just so crowded that forget about it. And uh, and we just see that the uh, it, it is damaging. The environment is getting damaged. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's a good point. It's not totally unregulated, but there's a lot of loopholes and. and areas where it's not regulated or not very well um, kayaking stand-up paddling on the windward side windsurfing kite I'm surfing about you name it. Of eight kayaks mm -hmm. with um, big sand well it used to be were they six months ago they would take their sand um, anchors and they would be out a little ways but now they're in very close and they're coming in towards the reef uh, several of them and I mean, we go over and talk to them and, and give them help, and you know. But uh, you know, right, right. Um, we can't, we can't force anything with our, yeah. you know. What well, we I mean, you know, if, if there's evidence of damage to coral anchors on coral, things of that sort, you can photograph that. We we're in the process of changing our coral laws to make them more enforceable to that very kind of thing. But in some cases, we've we've taken cases forward, even with our existing rules. And that just requires documenting, you know, with photographic evidence and being willing to testify. I know, I was, out of, I was a naturalist out at Ahihi, mm -hmm. and uh, we had to photograph everything, and, and a lot of times they'd go to court, and then they'd get, the, the judge would give them like $50 fine. Yeah, That's a, yeah. A lot of cases like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, ocean, you know, ocean activities is, is huge, and, and it's not regulated as well as it should be, and there's a lot of loopholes. So hopefully, uh -huh. hopefully, we'll catch up on that. Is there anybody on this side that had a question? Yeah. I didn't want to forget uh, you. Yeah, more of the discovery of bacteria, just like the Kauai reef, everything that's happening right now, or is that a different kind of? I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm not an expert on it, so I wouldn't be able to answer Sometimes that. It looks quite similar, only the endemic to Kauai is. Yeah. So Bay, Many of those reefs on Kauai um, are, are, you know, there's a lot of sediment and other stressors as well. So I'm sure that adds to the to the disease yeah. outbreak and the speed with which it's going. Molokini doesn't necessarily have that, but it has a whole lot of Montipra. So right. having all of that coral in a, in a dense area does lead it to be having more disease. It's the same rice coral that's being affected yeah. mostly on Kauai as well. Yeah. And, and they're, they're learning more and more about coral disease, so the actual pathogens that are causing it may or may not be the same, but they still could create the same type of disease symptoms. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert, so I haven't taken samples. Is the name of the disease seen here in Maui, what is it? Is there a name for it? <laughs> White spot disease, maybe, or, or yeah, I, I've heard several things, and they're not really they're not really like, you know, if you go to your doctor and he takes some blood work and he tells you this is, you have staph and staph infection. The names for the coral diseases are not like, they're just describing the symptoms. And that's an important distinction because the same signs and symptoms could be caused by many different pathogens. And they're just early in the process of identifying these. Uh, and some are probably, like I said, just background things that happen on a healthy reef anyway at that one to two percent range uh, but when it when things get out of whack and it goes haywire that's when you have a problem so that's what we're, we're trying to keep track of at this point <coughs> good question yeah. you you right this, this is might be out of the box but have you ever considered some kind of ocean as a problem with the fed i mean when you're talking about an average of 150 to 200 thousand people on this island 
at any one time. Each of them using suntan lotion over a period of years, you're, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of gallons of this going in. And the chemicals in this are designed to keep sun out if yeah, yeah. they land down on the, on the reefs. That the reefs need the sun to, yeah. to line, live. Yeah, we've considered it. In fact, there's a lot. There's a lot of schools of thought on that. Uh, there's been some prominent research done that that tended to suggest um, sunscreens had a negative impact on corals. Um, there's also a lot of questions about that research, um, being that the it was done in such a way where the the um, amount of concentration of sunscreen was unrealistic to natural marine environments where people are in. I think personally, I think if you have a, a bay or a shallow area where there's a lot of the human use and a lot of sunscreen and not a whole lot of water movement, it probably does have an impact. Um, some examples on the wall, you know, Waikiki, Aluana stuff. I mean, that, that's just gross. The water over there it doesn't move a whole lot in that in, inner reef area. Most of the areas around Maui, I don't feel it's a problem. Even if there's a lot of people, there's a lot of water movement through the area. It, it may be one of those stressors. You talk about corals being, you know, dying from a cut by a thousand wounds or something, a thousand cuts. It may be one of those stressors. But, you know, there's these huge, obvious things that we're seeing. Plumes of sediment, you know, fish stocks that are just decimated from what they should be. I feel those should be our main focus. Um, but yeah, you know, awareness about sunscreens and wearing rash guards instead of putting on sunscreen. Public awareness for those effects. Um, tour companies like Pacific Well Foundation and others that take a lot of people out have an opportunity to educate them and change their practice early on. I think that can that can have a positive effect in the long run. So yeah, it's a good point. It's not that out of the box. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Thank you again, Russell. You're welcome. There's stuff in the back corner if you want to grab it. I'll be hanging around. And if you guys you want, want to grab a store. chair. Now and, and put it in the back. Pick up your chair. I don't have to put it away. Thank you again, Thomas. Thank you, please.